Welcome to a weekend bonus episode of the Tech Meme Ride Home. I'm Brian McCullough. On a recent weekend long reads segment, I recommended a piece by The Verge's Julia Alexander asking whether or not Netflix's recommendation algorithms were broken or maybe just borked. We're going to talk a bit about that today, but also since Julia is on the streaming wars beat at The Verge, you know how much I love to talk about the streaming wars, and we are right about at the point where the battle is going to be joined in earnest. So, more about that. Please enjoy. I don't follow the... Actually, I don't follow Netflix closely enough to to know this, but um, somehow a bunch of shows got canceled lately that got on my radar. Like, I guess they must have been high-profile shows. And I I would have to imagine that this happens all the time, but somehow it feels different. Like... um, has there been a bunch of shows that have gotten the axe lately? I think we're seeing a couple of things happening. We're seeing a couple. So the first thing that happened is two shows that were beloved by fans um, and critics called Chuka and Birdie and the OA. Chuka and Birdie being an animated uh, adult series and the OA kind of being a sci-fi um, weird niche show um, got canceled. The first uh, Chuka and Birdie after one season, the OA after two seasons. And we're seeing, I would use the word outrage, which I don't usually use, um, about their cancellations. The interesting thing about this is that canceling shows after one or two seasons is not particularly new for traditional broadcast television. This happens quite often. But the difference is that up until a couple of years ago, Netflix wasn't really canceling anything. Uh, Netflix was increasing its spending size uh, on content. Uh, and the idea was just buy, 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 and they'll live on the platform, and, and we can build our own library. Um, so I think what we're seeing happen is people realizing that, oh, Netflix has actually become this type of cable, uh, this type of network that we're used to seeing on traditional TV, which they never position themselves as. So there's this really big moment of um, confusion happening among Netflix stands and then people who just watch television. So the idea essentially being the the long time gravy train where they'll they'll fund anything you want they'll bring back any show you want and let it run for as long as as the showrunners want it to go um that that gravy train is coming to an end and and have we've heard rumors about that right that that maybe internally um they're they're trying to uh watch their their pennies a little more and they they've been telling people internally that maybe shows that are kind of weak have to go Right. So Netflix uses a specific type of um, measurement to determine whether or not a show should be renewed. And it's called efficiency. That's, the, uh, that's, what, that's what they refer to it as. Efficiency to Netflix essentially means when we release a show, will it attract new subscribers and will it keep those who are at risk of canceling their subscription, um, will it keep them? And so shows like Stranger Things, hit both of those. Stranger Things new season brings in new subscribers and tends to keep um, subscribers who are maybe thinking of canceling. A show like Tuca and Birdie does not. Now, the issue, as um, Tuca and Birdie creator Lisa Hanawalt tweeted, is that when you think of Stranger Things, think of the amount of trailers and um, tweets and marketing and then the front page placement that show got from Netflix. When you mention something like Tuca and Birdie or The O.A., One, it didn't get much marketing, which has always been an issue with television. But the difference is, when we think of um, Netflix, which is an internet internet TV type thing, Netflix relies heavily on a recommendation algorithm for a lot of its shows. It's not um, actually similar to YouTube. Because there's so much, Netflix has the idea that we are going to recommend to you things that we think you would like based on what you've watched. So if the, rec- if the algorithm doesn't recommend a show, then we don't know how many people might have actually liked it, might have not, because we don't know how many people actually saw it on their account. And that's the big difference between Netflix and the way that shows are spread um, and traditional linear TV. When you think of, like, you open up your TV guide, and at 8 p.m., there's the same show for all of America who, uh, who are watching. Right. So I think I mentioned to you um... I, I featured your medium piece about this a couple 
couple weeks ago. Um, I'm just going to actually, I'm going to quote from it real quick. Um, you wrote, I'm the optimal subscriber for Netflix to recommend Tuca and Birdie 2. Not only have I watched every episode of BoJack Horseman more times than I can remember, but I watch every cartoon Netflix releases. So the idea would be, if if Netflix's algorithms work the way that we assume they do, even if I never would have gotten Tuca and Birdie on, on my launch screen, you clearly should have. Exactly. And uh, I didn't. And so what what do we know about why that might not have happened? That's the frustrating thing for us, and I would imagine even more for creators, where we don't know if that didn't happen. And Lisa Hanawalt, again, the creator, also doesn't know. And so we've seen Netflix respond to these kind of situations. We've seen um, CEO Reed Hastings and Ted Sarandos, who is Netflix's chief content officer. They've basically come out over the past couple of uh, investors' calls and said, we want to be more transparent with creators. We want to tell them how many people are watching their shows. We want to explain to them what's going on, but we're going to have to do that at our own time. Remember, this is a network that not even two or three years ago, their creators were sitting at a round table, I believe talking to a Hollywood reporter and Genji Cohen, who created Orange is the New Black, easily one of Netflix's longest running shows, if not actually its longest running show, saying Netflix is great. The only things they tell me when it comes to ratings are it did good or it did very good. I don't actually know. Right. Even like, even the showrunners is- have absolutely zero data. They have they, they they used to have zero data. I believe Netflix is now beginning to be more transparent, but it's not like every creator is being told. It, it it almost feels like a select few are being told how much their shows are doing. It's part of that because remember, you know, Netflix's model is we buy everything. There are no residuals. You don't have ownership. Although maybe that's different for like the. Um, uh, for some of the larger people and and some of these deals now with, with these $250 million deals, maybe that's different, but is it because since they own it, they don't have to tell anybody? I think it's because they don't have to, because Netflix has always positioned itself as not TV. Like it's a network, but it's not a network because it's on the internet because they do everything differently. Think of how Netflix releases TV, right? Everything comes out at once. You watch it when you want. So we're not going to have first day window, second day window, uh, weak windows publicly. They have it internally. They're looking at it internally the same way HBO executives would look at their internal data. The difference is we can see how much HBO or NBC is doing because we have Nielsen ratings. And we can clearly see, yeah, no one's really watching this. Maybe it's the time slot, but maybe there's just not enough interest. So we're going to cancel the show after one season. Again, this is normal. This is how television works. Um, and, and for good reason. So then they can put their their, their funds into a, a show that might do better. But with Netflix, because everything is so secretive, we don't know what's doing well and what's not. And, and creators don't know. And so it must be so frustrating to see your show be canceled after one season, not know how many people watched it, not know how many people uh, homepages it even appeared on, and then see Netflix strike $250 million deals with the creators of Game of Thrones or Three hundred million, or, or I think it's three hundred fifty million, deals with Ryan Murphy, who created American Horror Story, and that's got to be that, as understandable as that is from a business perspective. Because again, Netflix is looking to compete now. It is, I imagine, really daunting to creators. And, and Netflix used to be this really great haven for creators who could do stuff that tip traditional broadcast television just wouldn't have let happen. Yeah, I but I just kind of have to. F- I have to believe that it's maybe a have and have not situation because I have to believe that like David Fincher, if David Fincher wants to get some sense of the numbers, they're going to tell him, but uh, I imagine. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that, but let me come back. What was the, what was the metric that you said? It was the efficiency that they use. Yeah. It's called the efficiency metric. Okay. So let's, let's come back to your example. Um, you should have gotten Tuca and Birdie, if there's a new season of MST3K, that should be first on my screen, you know. Uh, (laughs) But I wonder, because I've been trying to think about why this, like, any kind of rationale for this. Like, is it a situation where they, I mean, they know who we are. They know you're, you know, young, urban, you're, you're not going anywhere. You're not canceling your subscription. And so... It's not that they feel like that they can abuse you and not entertain you, but like maybe they just don't 
the, like the, they're they're putting their efforts elsewhere, and so they're not gonna. But then, even why would they do that? Because there's no extra cost to serving you stuff that that will keep you coming back. The big thing that is happening, and the reason that we are now talking about the way that Netflix is changing, is because for the first time in a few years, in a very obvious and tangible way, Netflix is changing. And the biggest reason for that is because, well, there's two, but it all comes back to competition. Now, for the first time, Netflix is actually going to have competition. They've been, they've been able to run, they've been able to basically monopolize streaming uh, prestige type TV on the internet. And now in the next eight months, it's Netflix is going to have huge competition from like mega conglomerates, including Disney, AT&T, NBC, Universal, Amazon, and Apple. Like it's people, especially when you look at Amazon, Apple, AT&T, and Comcast, there's a lot of money coming in from different areas that they can invest into content and not necessarily have to worry about it as much. Um, Because they, especially you think of Amazon, right? Amazon's making money on the retail side. Prime video for them is like a fun thing they can do. and And it definitely drives part of their business but it's not the core of their business. Um, and that sets up, a, that sets them up in a really interesting way. Netflix doesn't have that Netflix. All it has is content. And so with losing series like friends in the office, which um, I refer to as snack type content, it's what you stay on Netflix for. It's what you, you finish stranger things, but then you don't cancel because you want to watch the office um, losing that. And then not having any major shows that right now really can compete with Disney, um, which is launching its service next month. All of that points to Netflix needing to change how it's doing its, its business, like point blank. And so the efficiency model comes into play because the efficiency model goes, we don't have time anymore to say, maybe the show picks up in season three or four and it doesn't matter because it's adding to our library. They need to say, we need a hit every single quarter to continue bringing people in. I um I actually did a, a small segment this week about um, Big Bang Theory and it's and Two and a Half Men are probably going to yeah. go to HBO Max for like a billion dollars or something like that. Um, I saw you on Twitter uh, talking about how Seinfeld is the next big one to go and is probably going to have some sort of huge bidding war, but it's like weirdly super super complicated in terms of like who the hell actually owns <laughs> Seinfeld. Yeah. Seinfeld is. Um, I should write an article about this um, <laughs> before my editor uh, <laughs> tells me to. But Seinfeld's a really interesting position. Seinfeld, um, almost like Friends, uh, be even more confusing. So essentially, Seinfeld aired in the 90s as an NBC show. NBC then sold the digital rights to Warner Media. Warner Media sold part of those digital rights to Sony. And Sony was the one who negotiated with Hulu, now owned by Disney, to have Seinfeld on that platform. So when Seinfeld comes up for renewal on streaming, I believe it's 2021, but it might be 2020, um, there's five major companies that, to an extent, have a hand on Seinfeld. And that doesn't even talk about bidding. That's just like, hey, some of us, like we kind of have a right to this but we also kind of don't because so much of it was sold so long ago, Um, which gets into like the really interesting part of streaming in general, which is these companies, no one really had the foresight about what was going to happen on the internet. And so everyone sold their rights in like the early 2000s, 2010s, everyone sold their rights. Uh, And now they're all clamoring to like fight to bring them back because they're, they're launching their own streaming services and, and they're building it around exclusivity uh, which is why you're seeing shows like Friends and The Office sell for uh, uh, 400 million, 500 million dollars for like five year contracts. Well, because you know, even eight or five years ago, they were all thinking that this is just this is free money that's just landed in our pockets. It's just additive. Uh, but now each and every one of these is like um, strategically crucial. <laughs> like it's yeah. it, it's like a, it's a choke point, and so it's more valuable than just you know making a hundred million dollars here and a hundred million dollars there. Yeah, I mean, you think about uh, Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter, one of the biggest franchises in the world, with, with bar none. Warner Brothers. Uh, who owns Harry Potter, sold the digital rights to NBC Uni. They were like, yeah, we don't really need these. We're going to sell them off to you. 
Now, Warner Media is about to launch HBO Max, which will include both TV shows and movies. Having the Harry Potter collection would be great for them because it's the one place you can watch Harry Potter, except that NBC Universal, which is also launching a streaming service, has the streaming rights to Harry Potter. I, I, I believe through 2024, it might be through 2025. So that's a huge franchise that because Warner Media was like, we're just going to license all of our content, we're going to give it to Netflix, we're going to give it to NBC Uni. Um, now they, they, they are fighting hard to, to bring it back, but they have all these deals that they have to like wait out or, or basically buy out. Um, and so that's why you're seeing shows like <laughs> Two and a Half Men and The Big Bang Theory being reportedly, like looking to be reportedly sold for $1.5 billion because these shows they think will act as the, the exact type of snack content that they need. Right. Like, it, your, your, a, your concept of the snack uh, television is in a way for certain use cases, more valuable than the, oh, I've got to see that new show, it's appointment viewing, it's whatever, or it'll draw new people in. Like, people need that snack comfort food TV. Right, because that's exactly it. You need your tentpole. I think, and this is where Disney is, is perfectly situated, because Disney's going to go, we're converting a bunch of our movies um, to be Disney Plus exclusive. I just saw... Excuse me. Just saw a report that Obi Wan, which was originally going to be a standalone movie, is probably going to be a standalone Disney Plus either film or series. Um, so Disney has the ability to every quarter say we're going to have a huge, huge tentpole thing that's going to bring people in. Um, they also have a ton of old movies and TV shows that right. people really want to continue watching. So Disney's situated where they're going. Not only are we the cheapest streaming service at six ninety nine a month. But we also have everything that you want. Right. They, are, they even they have the they have the snack because of the Fox deal. They've got like the Simpsons and Family Guy now too. Yes, ex- exactly. I, I think they have like National Geographic, you know, to compete with Netflix's kind of nature documentary. Mm. They're they're in a situation where, you know, uh, CEO Bob Iger of Disney uh, on a call with investors said this is the most important product launch of his tenure, and this is a man who bought Pixar, Lucasfilm, Star, uh, Marvel, and Fox. Um, streaming is everything. Re- real quick before I let you go, let me just get your take on a, a couple uh, things. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you wrote recently, um, near and dear to my heart, you, you wrote that Star Trek is probably Viacom, CBS's best chance at winning in streaming, which is ironic considering how they've mismanaged the Star Trek property for 20, 25 years, but uh, go, go into that a little bit. Cause I am, I am all, all in on the, the Picard show and I'm already planning my, my wrap up podcast. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so essentially it is the, it's the Disney play. It is for the first time CBS and Viacom, which originally split in 2005, I believe they're back, which means all the rights to Star Trek are back with one company. So they can do the multi-level. We're going to release a new movie. We're also going to release a animated series on like Pluto TV, which is their free streaming service. Then we're going to release even more CBS All Access shows. And all these are going to play into the same universe, right? So this is what Disney's doing, which is like, you have to go watch the movie, but then something in the movie will reference something in the show. So you have to go and watch the show. Um, CBS is one of the few, few conglomerates that can actually get away with doing this because they own so much um, intellectual property that they can do this with uh, Star Trek and Mission Impossible. And it's like, we're just going to build worlds that will bring people in. Once they're in, they have arguably the biggest library out of any streaming service. Like they have a huge archive of shows that people want to watch. And so it's like, once they fix CBS All Access so that it's no longer a piece of garbage to actually watch, it is, it is shape. It could shape up to be uh, a huge competitor because Viacom and CBS are now one company. That means that digital rights, which is the heart of the streaming wars are all under one roof. Uh, so that's basically what that is. Uh, what's your take on how many streaming services most people will subscribe to? I, it, Cause people are, you know, openly saying this, it's not going to be seven. Uh, no. What do you think? Could it be three? This is the, the other piece that I need to write. You know what people keep forgetting when we talk about streaming wars uh, is sports. The oh, I, I'm not forgetting service, that, no. <laughs> the most important streaming service in my life is my NBA league pass. <laughs> and that is like the one thing I wouldn't give up. And that's 
$18 a month, let's round up to 20. That's $20 a month that I'm paying for something. I can only, you know, on my budget, I can maybe add a couple more. And honestly, Netflix right now is not one of them. I'm looking, for me personally, I'm looking at, you know, NBA League Pass, which is $20. Disney's uh, Bundle, because that's $13. And I get three services, including Hulu and ESPN. ESPN, uh, right. Plus. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, um, I think I would spend the money on, on HBO Max, even though it's the more expensive one, which we think is going to be about $16, $17 a month. In terms of the content I want, I'm paying for HBO now. I watch, I use HBO now more than anything, and that's already $15 a month. Um, so I would probably get rid of Netflix in a heartbeat. And I think that's scary for Netflix, because I bet you there are a lot of people who are like, well, I know I can have HBO and I'm going to enjoy it. And I know I can have Disney. I'm going to enjoy it. And then I know I, I need my, one of my sports things, whether it's NHL, NBA, NFL. And, and so ne- Netflix, Netflix is now, Netflix is always weirdly always shied away from sports. Like every time people have asked them that they're like, yeah, that's not, that's not our, our ball. I think the, if there was ever a company that was going to get into sports, that wasn't Disney because they own ESPN. Uh, it would be Amazon because they're already testing it. It works for them. And more importantly, the, the, the cost to license sports is immaculate. It is not immaculate. Sorry, it is, uh, it's insane. Insane, it is yeah. <laughs> insane. And so you think about the companies that can actually viably do this. Amazon is like one of the few because Amazon has so much money coming in from retail and from other areas that it's like, sure, we can spend the money and we don't have to think about it. It's like, yeah, it's a bet and it'll probably pay off, but who knows? Now, they haven't said much. We know they're testing with NFL. We know they're testing with other things. But I, if, if anyone's going to try to do a huge actual sports play, I think it would be Amazon. Um, it sounds like you're a little more uh, concerned about Netflix. Like, I'm, I'm going to talk to um, Matthew Ball next month, who, you know, is the, the, the uber Netflix bull in terms of, like, Netflix is playing 11th dimensional chess and, and all this stuff. But am, am I reading you right that, like... Um, if if you were Netflix, you're a little worried right now. Um, so Matthew Ball is like a hero of mine. I like just <laughs> I just want to be Matthew Ball. You can tell yes. me that. Okay, okay. But, uh, <laughs> but I I think you know I, I think I wrote at the end of one of my articles. Netflix will be fine. The thing that everyone kind of forgets when we talk about Netflix is that they've hit not their they haven't tapped out on the United States, but most of the people in the states who are going to have Netflix accounts have a Netflix account and they know that Netflix isn't worried because Netflix is like we're one of the only streaming services that is affordable and in and global you know they're looking at India they're looking at um, Latin America and the great thing about this is that they're spending a lot of money in these regions they're ordering local shows local movies and those movies and shows at least according to Sarandos and Hastings are performing super well globally. It's why you have a lot of people in the States who are obsessed with Latin America, uh, or sorry, South, South, uh, South American shows. They're, they're seeing this content play where they're like, you know, we can, Disney can maybe build 12 million subscribers in its first year in the States. We're going to build 20 million subscribers um, in India and, and other parts of Asia and, uh, and other countries around the world. So Netflix is going to be fine. I think they probably are like, how do we keep um, reinvigorating content for our, our domestic audience. I think they're wondering how do we define who we are when we've got competition that is very definable. You know, you think of like HBO is definable, Disney is definable. Um, so I think what we're going to see is them doing, like, trying to cultivate a voice so that way people know what they are. But Netflix is going to continue spending money on content. They're going to continue building. Um, so th- they're going to be fine. I just think I am kind of like Netflix hasn't done much for me. And you're you're personally bearish lot. in your own personal life on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I meant to do a piece on this m- myself. Um, to me, the biggest issue for Netflix is Disney because it pre- prevents Netflix having control over pricing power, which inevitably Disney will bring up their price too. But until that happens, Netflix is stuck in the water. And I wonder what that does to their, their long-term spreadsheets and things like that. Um, okay. Uh, to, I'm going to let you go. This is the last question. Um, do you have a take on Apple's uh, morning show teaser trailer? <laughs> I said this to someone, and they said, please don't write that take. Uh, but my take is 
that as someone who liked the newsroom, <laughs> I'm excited for Apple to uh, basically try to do its version of the newsroom. I think it's, it, it's great talent. It could be a disaster. And I'm still like, I'm here for it. It. It, yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I love how the legacy of the newsroom is the sh- the greatest show that everyone hate loves. You know, <laughs> and then the ironic thing is, is like this is a show about a medium and a <laughs> format that essentially streaming has made redundant. <laughs> so it's a Bill weird. Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, anything you want to plug? No, uh, follow our streaming coverage on theverge.com where we're going to be doing a lot of it. Loudmouth Julia on uh, Twitter. Thank you, Julia. 